Okay. Well, after that introduction, I think we can go home because I think David's covered most of what we've got. Okay. Thank you, colleagues, for coming. I don't often have a chance to explain what I'm doing and why. We're losing the hat. Um, <laughs> it lasted longer than I thought. Um, I don't often get the opportunity to share what I do and why. I'm too busy, usually, dashing down the corridor with a bag of bits to the next workshop. So I don't often get the chance to talk about things. So thank you to Wahia for giving, us, giving me the opportunity. Looking around this room, I see many people that I have persuaded to lose a weekend or spend a Saturday um, doing a workshop or even spending the weekend at the Rico Arena Imagineering Fair. So I need to say thank you to my colleagues for supporting me, for turning up to workshops out of hours. It's been a lot of fun things we've done together and it's because you guys have given your time to me. Okay, so let's get going, what motivates me. So this is a picture from the city that we live in. Um, I live in Coventry. It's a picture of educational attainment in the city. And it's disappointing, I think, to see that kind of picture because it's, it's not showing a, a fair distribution of attainment, I think. Um, and this is the backdrop to what I'm doing and why I'm doing it, why I do outreach, and specifically why I do widening participation. Because it's, it just means that people haven't got the same chances to achieve things. There could be a number of reasons. In the city, we've got two universities. So education is quite an important part of the city life. I think you'd agree. And also I'm focusing on Coventry because I live there. It's a similar picture. You'd find similar pictures in Warwickshire as well. Similar pictures in Birmingham and so on. So I suppose I wanted to know what I could do to help. We have many, many committed teachers around us in Coventry and Warwickshire. But we can see some schools struggle to resource the curriculum. And so that's what started me out to see how could I help? What could I do about it? How can I bring my specific skills to try and bring some equity into this equation. And I, I would describe my skills as computing skills, computer science skills, and technology-related skills. So it is quite an interesting picture, isn't it? There are other pictures. We could put up other measures there. There are many different measures, um, but it doesn't show equality of opportunity. Oops, wrong way. Okay. So in 2007, I linked with my colleague, Irene Glendinning, at Coventry University. Irene, at that time, headed the BCS Coventry Schools Competition. And that was working with local schools to support technology-related projects. The children worked in teams. So you can see here, this is a picture from one of the newsletters that we did. And my family, as well as my work colleagues, know to hide, I think. If I'm on a project, they know to hide because my daughter got roped into doing a lot of the, the work on the newsletters. So I'm grateful to my family as well for the work that they've done and not saying no half the time when I was like, could you do this? Okay, so we worked on the schools competition. It was an inclusive competition. We wanted to invite as many young people to the finals exhibition as we could fit in the room. So you can see there, there's groups of children explaining their work um, to, to people there. And it was a lot of fun, the competition. And we needed judges. So back to interdepartments, asking people and asking colleagues to be judges. So, we got first silly picture number one. Um, this is my colleagues, the WMG staff, in their judging hats. In order to make children feel more at home, 
we decided to use the concept of judging hats so that they knew when they were speaking to somebody, they were judging. So, sorry colleagues. There's a few more embarrassing pictures as well. So, here we go. This is my BCS colleagues in their hats as well. And underneath is some of the technology volunteers who said they would help as well. So we've got them in their silly hats. And it, <laughs> it was a lot of fun. One thing we realised, one thing we realised after we'd run it a couple of times, was the real value in this was actually the network that we created around this competition. This competition wasn't run in a huge budget, was it, Irene? No, it was run in a minimal budget. And this network we were able to form was um, just vo a lot of voluntary activity and people working together. But by working with the professional bodies, the ICT advisors, the secondary school teachers, the local universities and other organisations in this area, um, it gave us a very clear focus for our activities. So we didn't waste time trying things that, we did, that might or might not work. We were doing things in response to requests from schools, requests from um, LEAs. So we were able to do very, very focused activities. And I think that meant we went quite far, much further than I think we expected when we, on the outset. It led to regional teachers conferences, so we had workshops on topics um, and every second year we had a teachers conference. We ran lots of workshops for teachers and some of my colleagues here were grateful, were kind enough to come and run workshops with us. Um, so it was about bringing the things that we knew about, the technology um, and the software, to to work with the teachers who were the professionals in terms of delivery. So it was a real, true collaboration. And it's created a quite a strong community, I think, of people working together, which I was very glad. We didn't realise this was going to come out, did we? But it was one of the key strengths. At the same time as we were working away in our little area here, nationally, other people realised there were issues in schools and there was problems in the ICT. And it led to this creation of an organisation called Computing at Schools. And this is a grassroots organisation with teachers in it, um, trying to work together to resolve some problems. And in 2010, Computing at School linked to the British Computer Society um, and became separate to it, but part of it, to, and it gave it an official status, if you like. In 2012, the first significant report came out by the Royal Society, highlighting some key issues that were causing problems in the subject area. First of all, the term ICT was confusing to a certain extent. I think I had assumed ICT was a lot of computing activities. Other people probably made the same assumption. But actually, in this report, they tease out that ICT is a mixture of computer science, digital literacy, and information technology. So that was one of the things they clarified, if you like, for everybody, um, so that we were all clear of what components were there. The second thing they pulled out was this sort of vicious circle here, that because there was a shortage of teachers with subject knowledge, it was often delivered by non-specialists, passionate non-specialists, but still non-specialists. And ICT curriculum mainly focused on digital literacy, right? Um, whereas I think people like me had assumed it, would, it was more computing science. It was then perceived as being low-level skills. I'm not sure why. And decisions were then being made about it on negative impressions. But one of the problems was fewer people were going through to study computer science post-16. So the numbers taking computer science were dropping, um, which was leading to more. So this is a vicious circle. I think one of the wrong messages that came out of this report 
was that ICT was a waste of time. And I think that's been a real big mistake. But there has been quite a clear focus on computer science. But I worry about the digital literacy because digital literacy is a key skill in today's world. And if young people are not confident users of computers and other things, they will not get certain jobs, they will not have the same opportunities, they will not get promotion. So I think I'd like to sort of say that was a wrong message because I think digital literacy is incredibly important. Okay, so computing at school highlighted some of the issues. And just to sort of update you, there's been a whole lot of activity since then. They're part of a consortium that was awarded 80 million in 2018 for computer science education. So there's a significant amount of funding now gone in to education that wasn't going in before, to teachers' education. Okay, now, if you're of a nervous disposition, you need to look down. Don't look at the screen, okay? Shut your eyes, there's something pretty horrible going to appear on the screen. Are you ready? Brace yourself, guys, okay? Right. <laughs> okay? We've not had anybody faint in the audience. That's a good sign. Okay. What's wrong with this space? <coughs> That's a good answer, actually. What else is wrong with it? Yes. <laughs> yes, thank you, Genevieve. <laughs> what is wrong with this space for me, and it is a grim, this is a grim example. This is not Warwick. Okay, I didn't take this at Warwick. <laughs> Ardell BMG, no? <laughs> okay. Um, this is a particularly grim example. But the key thing is that there is no space to collaborate here. There is, they've even got walls up to stop you. And there is no space, no workspace. So all you can do is sit in your cubicle and use the computer. Okay? I'm not saying computer labs are a bad thing. I spend most of my life teaching in computer labs. I am very passionate about computer labs, as my colleagues will know. But this is not a sort of creative zone. If you look at these things, you feel warm and excited by them. You want to pick them up, yeah? Computers are just tools that we use. So if we're going to put computers in that kind of space, you wouldn't use those pens and pencils in that space, would you? So why are we putting tools that are equally creative in that kind of constrained space? So that's something I feel quite passionate about. I want people to see computers as creative tools. And I think there's a further difficulty in a lot of what's called educational software because a lot of educational software isn't creative and can be quite constrictive. So I spent a long time looking for things that would introduce computing to children in a fun and entertainment way. And I spent a long time looking, many years. Um, I also want to blur the edges between computers and our physical world. So I want to sort of break down some of the barriers. So in 2007, I was delighted when MIT released Scratch. I was really excited by Scratch. Um, has everybody here seen Scratch? No. Okay. Some people have. So what we've got here, these are scripts. Here we've got sprites. And these scripts control the sprites. So each sprite here can have its own script. And you can't see the colors that well, but all the commands are color-coded. So if you want to move your sprite, you look in the blue section and you find commands like move 10 steps, or you can turn. So the blue commands are all about motion. The purple commands are all about looks. So it's easy for children, to, if they want to move their sprite, they go and hunt in the blue section. Okay? So it's easy for people to navigate. There's another thing here. Blocks click together to create a script. It's like Lego bricks. You can't click the wrong 
wrong command into the wrong place, if you like. You can only connect things that work well together. So that's quite a breakthrough. And these sprites can have their own costumes. So if you want to animate your character to get the cat to walk or whatever, you can give him multiple costumes um, where he's moving his legs, and then you can go th run through those costumes to animate the character. So it's, it's a lot of fun to use. Um, the key thing about Scratch, though, is it's multimedia. There's sound, there's graphics, and you can't, you, because it's block-based languages, you're picking and dropping the blocks, you can't make typing errors. And if anybody's ever done any programming, the frustration of mistyping a command for beginners is great. So this removes a whole category of errors from coding. Okay, so I knew it was appealing to children. And I joined the Scratch community on the 1st of July, 2007, and got really excited by the things that kids were doing. Um, so I'm going to show you some examples. I'm not sure the clicker is going to work. So I'm going to show you some examples. This is my, uh, a, an adventure story. Now, in order to show you it here, I've made a little video of me playing the game. You're not allowed to judge me. I'm not very good at computer games, OK? So I get eaten at the end, so such is life. OK, so if I play Maya. There's no sound, is there? Hallo, ich bin die Biene Maya und du sollst mich auf meinen Reisen begleiten. Zum Ja, Flip, ich werde den Schlüssel suchen. Zum Dumm. computer games. I'm by Jacob. Jacob's the expert in our house. Okay, so that was the first example I came across. Oh, it just blew me away because up until then kids had been sort of sketching stuff out and nothing multimedia and so on. So I've got another example to show you and this is an older person that's done this one. That was good, wasn't it? And this is what I mean by blurring the edges between the real world and the sort of digital world, because they've sketched things and then they've animated things in Scratch. And I think these are both wonderful examples that I've come across. So what's happening with Scratch? Um, what are the key concepts? So this is 
sort of extracted from communications of the ACM 2009. And these are the creators behind Scratch writing out some of the key concepts. It's worth reading. There's a lot more than I've got here. But the key ones are, it's a low floor. It's easy for people to get started, to get going. There's very few barriers to participation. Next one, high ceiling. You can create complex projects. You've seen two quite complex projects. Most of the projects on the website I was seeing were nothing like that, but those are two particularly good examples of what people were doing with things. Um, so you don't get bored of it. Children work on this site for months, years, working away at the Scratch programs. And wide walls. So there's room for many different types of programs and interests in there and different learning styles. So that is the key concepts in Scratch. And where did Scratch come from? So Scratch, there's a huge amount of development went on behind that. It's based on a language called Logo. Now, does anybody recognise, because I think they, Logo was used in primary school, yeah? So Logo was developed in 1967, guys, um, by Papert, Solomon and Ferzeig. There's been many different variants since then, but they, this is where Logo started, and Scratch built on a lot of the experience of Logo. And over here, you've probably heard about the Logo Turtle, those that you know about it. That is the very first turtle that they built there. It's like a dustbin, wheel, dustbin on wheels, isn't it? And here's a bit more refined turtle, and you can see the children have been drawn a teddy bear or something. If you want to know a bit more about the background to Logo, this book here, Mindstorms, was published by Papert to explain a lot of the principles that went on behind it. And this was published in 1983, and it's still an interesting read. Okay. So, we get on to the community. Scratch is a lang computer language. However, it is also a community. When you're learning programming, you learn programming, you usually there's a place where people learn, hang out to learn from each other. In Scratch, that's the Scratch community. So they created a site that supported, it was designed into the language to support learners. And there are some key concepts in that community. One is you can participate in different ways on there. So you can comment on others' work. You can post your own projects on there and ask people to comment on them. You can remix other people's work. What a remix is, you look at somebody else's program, you do your own variant of it, and then you share it. So there's a lot of remixing goes on. You can see how other people have achieved certain effects. If somebody's done a really cool background, you can see how they've done it. To date, there's 40 million projects shared on the Scratch website, which is an awful lot of activity around the world. And a lot of people are not able to join in the Scratch community. So in countries like Africa, lots of children don't have the chance to be part of the Scratch community because of the connectivity issues in certain places. So there's many, many more than 40 million projects being created in Scratch. I watched the community. I started to see things emerge over time. So there were some lovely projects started to come out. The first project is add yourself in. Because you can remix work, this concept of drawing a plane, plane ground and add yourself into it, put it back on the site, somebody else downloads it, they add themselves in, playing with a ball or on the swing. And over time, these projects would fill with little, pic, little representations of the children um, all in the same playground. So it was lovely seeing these add yourself in projects. Um, children then started to get recognition if they were good at drawing characters, people would say, could you draw this character for me? Could you do this one? Some children were composing music on the site and they would compose music to create dramatic effects for others. Moving backgrounds, storytelling, they were sharing their talents. So there was huge amounts of collaborations and out of that came companies. 
So the, the children formed companies to do productions. So Greybeard Productions, they produced Night at Reedy Castle, which was an adventure. You went through the door and you went into a series of different rooms. And they worked months and months and months on this project. It was absolutely fascinating to watch as they added bits to it. So Scratch is not just a language, it's a learning community. And we'll come back to the community side. There's collaboration going on, participation. It's expanding skills and supporting each other. So I've got another example of a lovely application. See if we can get this one running. it is an internet meme no we don't spend enough time on the internet <laughs> so one of the things that started happening was the scratch community started replicating their own versions of internet memes so this was an internet meme that was going around the world in sort of 2005 and they ge were generating their own versions in 2007 and this is an example of a remix project so you can see that there's different styles of drawing. So each child has downloaded it, added in their own eight seconds and uploaded it again. You can see there's different ages working together. It doesn't matter that it's not all the same quality. There's something really joyous about that video. Yes? No? Bored? <laughs> okay. So I could see we had a good tool here and that we could use this to make a difference in Coventry. And I was running workshops with Chris at the Coventry LEA, trying to get teachers to use Scratch. But there's a difference between teaching somebody, showing somebody how language works, and actually using it in the classroom. And we were struggling to get Scratch onto the school computers. Because if it's not on the school computers, the children haven't got access to it. So one way to do it was to run workshops in schools, but there's one of me. <laughs> so I went to Warwick Volunteers, Warwick Volunteers, who are a fantastic group of people, and they helped me set up the Technology Volunteers Project um, in 2008. And we've had generations of students. It's a student-led project, which I think is really important. They train themselves, they develop their own resources, um, they lead the work in the schools. Um, and so, with their help, we've been able to get it onto lots of school computers, show teachers it worked in their classroom with their children. That's really powerful, showing people it worked. Um, and really, I think in a lot of schools, we got created little communities of learners that were using Scratch. So, some of these pictures here. Mozfest, yes. If you not, don't know about Mozfest, it's a Mozilla International Festival that takes place in London every year. It's a big geek fest. But we're very popular in the youth zone for our workshops. 
Um, they're very child friendly. So we've been fortunate to have our work selected and experience the madness that is Mozilla Festival. There's 2,000 people descend on it and you're running workshops and you might start off with 10 people in your section. It's open plan everywhere. Um, and you might end up with 50 by the time you're halfway through. So you've got to be very fleet, very dynamic. It's a real challenge to teach in that environment. So hats off to the students that have worked with me on that. Anyway, so that's our workshops. We've been fortunate to share the resources we've created at MIT and at the Scratch conferences as well. Okay, what have we shared? We've shared three general workshops. Programming by stealth, we called it. Children were creating an aquarium of fish. But each fish has its own script and that it follows. So you might want your big fish to chase your little fish, or your little fish to chase the big fish, or whatever. But children worked and created little characters in aquariums, and they were learning coding skills. Sensing our world, we were fortunate to be able to buy these boards, which took scratch into the physical world. So there's a whole lot of sensors on these. There's light sensors, there's a microphone, and we were able to create scripts. If you've got a spider, it could hide if it was dark, it could come up out when it was dark or whatever. So we were able to create programs and projects to respond to the physical world. The final thing we did is introduction to Arduino. Arduinos are a cheap little board that you can program and do control. They, will, they cost 20 pounds. The software is free. There are many lessons out there for how to use it. And so we use this as an introduction to electronics for secondary school teachers, secondary school children. So hats off to the volunteers. Some of them are here today that have carried on this work through, through over many years. And hats off to Warwick volunteers for all their support that they've given. Because every year we go around about 200, 250 children. Okay. We got quite into some of these things, probably too much into it. So we started by leaving these boards with the teachers for a few weeks so that the kids could still carry on developing their programs. But we found after a week or so, they kind of got fed up with the light sensor and the sound sensor. So we started looking at what we could connect in because there's, these, are, these measure resistance. So if there's anything going on in terms of resistance, we were able to create little sensors to take account of it. So one, the tilt sensor up there is just a water bottle with two pins sticking it, half full of water. And if you tilt it, it changes the resistance. So we could tell, using the water bottle, we could control things. We then went a bit mad, and then we created a water bottle joystick. If you're going to fly around the world, do not pack these things in your luggage, <laughs> because your luggage gets very carefully examined by security. OK. So we knew we were onto something with the physical computing. So that was the work I've done with the technology volunteers but I've collaborated with other colleagues at Warwick. So Illuminating Engineering um, is an example of work that I've done with Simon Lee. It's blinky light. In the morning, it's a one-day workshop we created for the Royal Institution. In the morning, you learn how to program an LED and get different lighting effects. And in the afternoon, you learn how to do CAD, um, 2D CAD to create a sort of mood lamp. So that was quite popular, and you can see the results of the children there. We were blown away by how creative they were. We carried on with blinky lights. Um, and this is a collaboration with my brother and other family members. Um, Tales for Tales. This is exploring the link between storytelling and technology. The idea was to use a box and put LEDs in there. Um, and control it wirelessly using these cheap microprocessors. These cost about four or five pounds. They're not expensive. So you can create a tile for less than 10 pounds. And if you've got a power pack in there, you can um, drive it wirelessly from scratch. And my brother was kind enough to write me the software because each of these tiles is actually a web server on Wi-Fi. Unfortunately, we need to do a little bit more work on this because university networks 
hate these little processors <laughs> with a vengeance because they're simple Wi-Fi devices. They don't pass any of the protocols we've got at university. So anyway, but you can see the results of some of the workshops that people have created. Very, very beautiful tiles and they're animated by switching on and off the LEDs. Carried on with things. I've been fortunate enough to get hold of a digital embroidery machine and I've been doing work with turtle stitch. So you can see, scratch like commands up here, we're creating sort of drawings here, but we can then take them and stitch them, which is really a lot of fun. If you create an outline, it's not just about embroidery, if you create an outline, you can stitch it onto two bits of fabric, cut it out, turn it inside out, and you've got a little, you can make little characters. So we've sort of, this is a work in progress as well. I've been sort of dipping into this um, with um, workshops in the last few months. One project that I think has been quite important to us has been the Heroward College project. It's a co-creation project. Um, instead of going in there as experts saying you need this bit of assistive technology, we went in there to teach their young people computer-aided design, and it was led by my colleague, Diane Burton, um, who did a magnificent job teaching CAD to these young people. If you don't know what Her where Heriwerk College is, it's two miles that away, I think, and it's a national college for young people with disabilities and additional needs. So assistive technology is quite important to them, and it was quite empowering watching them group it, develop their own simple assistive technology. And of all the work I've done, I think this has been one of the projects I've been so happy to be part of. Um, but I take my hat off to Diane for delivering this project because it was not an easy project to deliver. And here you can see one of the young students showing CAD to Christina Hughes and the principal of Heriwood College. Okay. So just to sort of summarise the, the link, the things I think that are linked. Um, this, is, this is going. Can you hear me? Okay. So, right. Okay. So, I knew this game was going to be trouble. Right. Okay. Um, so just to sort of summarise, what I've skated over quite a lot of different projects, but there are some real strong themes I think along there. So first of all, as a teacher, I tend to focus on content and outcome. So I'm always reflecting on the content um, oops, and the quality of the content. Sorry, let me just get this back. I knew the gown would be the... Oh, we don't want to go through that again. So anyway, um, content. So as an educator, um, I focus very much on content. And I take account of the context, but context is really important for learners. Um, it's how they can relate to things. And getting a good context for the work means that they bring their enthusiasm to it and start pulling at what's happening, rather than you trying to push them to learn things. So having a, the context is so important. Um, I think that's something we know, um, but I, it's something that I've learned over the years and, and still have to work with. The final thing is community. Um, the value of having a learning community and creating a learning community is enormous. I've shown you some examples of what the community projects in Scratch, but a lot of the Heriward College thing was about community. There's been a strand um, through a lot of these projects, building community, building the community, the technology volunteers, and then um, carrying on the work. So I think there's... If, if in my teaching, I think I need to focus a lot more now about the community aspects. So how do you seed learning communities? How do you grow learning communities? Um, and I think in outreach and in outreach activities, that's something that I want to focus more on growing that sense of community because I think that then allows people to learn from each other. Getting there towards the end. Um, these are some books that explore some concepts that 
I think if, you, if you're interested in Scratch and interested in finding out some more things, these are interesting books. This one here, the age goes from low to high, so this end is suitable for eight, sorry, four-year-olds to eight-year-olds, eight plus, and adults. So I think these books have influenced how I feel about things, how I think about things. Um, computational fairy tales is just good fun. Um, so I think they're a good read. Finally, to finish, I went back to a very old article published in 1971 by Seymour Papert and Cynthia Solomon, 20 things to do with a computer. And these were the 20 things they came up with. I went and checked how many of them I'd done. <laughs> and I've done 15 out of the 20. So I've still got things to do. OK. So I think that's me finished. department Dave Mullins who is uh, well I think he's now in Hong Kong I was going to say he's on his way but I think he'll be there by now uh, on a work trip otherwise he would have been here tonight so I think one of the the themes that has come out of um, this evening with Margaret's talk actually even with David's introduction as well um, and from the 12 years that I think kind of Margaret and I have, have worked uh, together is that pretty much everything that Margaret does is for the benefit of others um, there's probably very little that Margaret does which is really for the benefit of, of herself, and I'll come on and say a few words about that in a moment. But I think in HE, um, we talk a lot about impact. Um, it's, it's very much the word of the moment, has been for the last kind of few years, with the REF, the Research Excellence Framework, looming. We all talk a lot about research impact and what that means. We try and define it. But I think what we've seen here tonight and what we've heard from Margaret is very much a definition of kind of impact in itself, and I think... Margaret, if you can think about the impact that you've had on so many individuals over so many years, I think it's an incredible achievement, so, so well done on that. Um, I mentioned about Margaret putting maybe others ahead of herself, and I think there's maybe two examples, sorry Margaret, I'm going to share, um, going back over, over my 12 years of, of working with her. And the, the first one was actually probably fairly soon after I started at WMG. Um, and Margaret came to, to my office door and said, um, oh, I've got some good news. She said, um, I've been asked to go to MIT and present at a conference there. I think it might have been the inaugural Scratch conference. Um, and obviously, I was very excited about it. And I said, well, congratulations. That's great. It's not every day that you get an invitation to talk about your work at MIT. Um, so I started to talk about how we might be able to fund Margaret to attend. Um, and she stopped me and she said, no, she said, that's, that's not why I'm coming to see you. She said, what we've got to do is make sure that I can send the students there. She said, we've got to find enough money to send four or five of the technology volunteers to go to MIT. She said, I want them to have the platform, I want them to have the opportunity, I want them to be able to take advantage of that. And I thought, well, that, that's not very normal. Um, that's not the normal conversation that, that an individual would have, would have had in that circumstance. So that was a very early kind of sign, really, of, I think, how Margaret operates. Um, and then maybe one that, that's a bit more recent regarding her National Teaching Fellowship. So, as, as David mentioned earlier, Margaret was a very worthy recipient of a Warwick Award for Teaching Excellence. Um, a few years ago, and after she received that, I think myself and some other colleagues uh, were trying to persuade Margaret to apply for, uh, for the NTF um, award, and Margaret tried to find lots of reasons why she shouldn't go for it, <laughs> um, including, um, firstly, that she doesn't really think that um, maybe this type of activity is really of interest to them. She said, well, I probably won't meet the criteria. It's kind of not really worth me applying. And also, I'm just too busy. I've got all of my student activities. I've got lots of outreach activities coming up. I don't think I can meet the deadline. Um, luckily, a few of us managed to persuade her otherwise. Um, and I think certainly we weren't at all surprised, Margaret, that it was successful. I think very much, of course, they recognised the value of the work that you did. And I think that's helped to them bring the kind of journey through to the award of your um, personal professorship, and I think that brings us full scale and full circle to why we're all here today. 
So I think just final comment from me on behalf of the department is just to say thank you for everything that you do for WMG and beyond, um, and have done for over 30 years. Um, so certainly very much we were talking earlier, I think Margaret is now one of our old timers within the department. <laughs> and I say that affectionately, so um, absolutely. And I think, you know, we look forward to carrying on on, on the, that journey with you. I think you have a very special place in the department. Um, I think it's a unique role that, that you have in WMG. And it's one, though, that you have created really through your own enthusiasm, vision, creativity, and just kind of sheer drive to kind of get it done, as I said, very much for the benefit of others. So well done and thank you. <laughs>